I think I'm just going to make a start if you do guys don't mind. So I'll get my introduction over with and then those that come in can get the good stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about Unity in the Classroom for creating virtual reality simulations and for educational games. Um, so this is me. Um, right now I'm an upper school computer science teacher at a private school in Charleston, South Carolina. But as you can maybe tell from the accent, and I'll try and go slow, that's not where I'm from. So maybe the, the college that I worked at for 19 years might give you a clue where I'm from. So I'm from West College. I, I, I taught there for 19 years at West College Scotland. I was head of department for computing for about the last four years. So but the past, it says 19 years, it was actually more like the last 10 years we really did games development was the biggest course we did at that college. And I taught on that for a good while. The last two or three years we were using Unity there. Um, I'm also a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional. Well, I was a Most Valuable Professional. So for the teachers out there, I did what all our students have done. I waited to the last minute this year to put in my submissions to renew as an MVP. And I waited till Saturday, and it was during the Sunday. And because I'd moved from the UK to the US, something had messed up with my account, and I couldn't put my submissions in. And Microsoft, I contacted Microsoft, and they didn't fix it till the Monday. And by that point, it was too late. And evidently, they take the submission deadlines really serious. So um, <laughs> I have to resubmit in a few months to get back in the program. Hopefully, they'll let me back in, because I'm wearing the T-shirt still that they gave me. So <laughs> if I get, I don't know if I get in trouble for wearing it, even though I'm not officially an MVP anymore. I, I'm still a Microsoft innovative educator expert, though. I, st I got that one in time. Um, that's my Twitter if you want to get in touch afterwards, DRent in 72. Okay, um, I became an MVP f with Microsoft and started working with them because of some educational games I wrote. Once I started teaching games development, I decided to start making some educational games as well. I like that picture just because those girls are doing French numbers and it shows how games can engage kids in education because you don't usually see kids that engaged in learning about French numbers. Um, and that was some more kids playing those games. After I did those games that used Xbox controllers, we did get on the BBC News for like two minutes. Um, I started doing uh, games using Kinect. Now, Kinect has kind of died a death, but it was, its technology is getting used in virtual reality and the likes of these headsets. Um, but the Kinect was a motion sensing camera, so I developed a couple of games that used Kinect. The ones with the hats is basically Fruit Ninja. Probably most of you know what Fruit Ninja is. That was basically math Fruit Ninja. So you had the time, you had the multiplication tables coming up, like the three times table. And if the number was in it, they swiped through with their hands. But the one that actually worked really well was that one, which I called Connect Angles. And the idea of that game was you had to actually draw the angle with your arm. So if it said 45 degrees, they had to make 45 degrees with their arm, and it told them how close they got. So he's laughing because he was way out. That was 90 degrees, and he was, that's what he thought 90 degrees was, whereas this kid got it exactly right. But you, that game worked really well in that um, they were learning about angles, and I also um, added to it like north, south, east, and west, and percentages, and um, fractions as well, like a third of the circle. It worked really well because they were playing against each other, um, they were enjoying the game and they were learning while playing. I always think with educational games, some of the educational games that they get it wrong because you, you all have played educational games where say it's about history and you answer a question about history and then you get play a game as reward. That's not an educational game, right? That's, an, that's a game with a bit of education thrown in. So the trick is, and it's really hard to do with educational games, is where you can get them to actually learn while playing which is the one that that did really well. I based it off a dancing game on the Xbox 360 where you compete against each other and you pose at the end, so I had them posing for the camera as well. One of the, I just mentioned this briefly because this is a, a pet thing of mine, is that games development is cross-curricular. For A lot of you guys in here are teachers. If you're teaching games, try and get other departments involved. Games involves almost everything, so you've got maths, um, calculating the angle that that car's pointing in, the vector it's going in is maths, it's trigonometry. You've got Angry Birds, which is a physics game using Newton's laws and gravity. You've got art and games development. You've got music. Some of my, a couple of my kids this year actually wrote their own music for their games. Um, you've got English. One of the Monty Python crews, his daughter is an uh, author and she, she now works full time writing storylines for games. She, I forget her name, but she wrote the storyline for one of the last Tomb Raider games. 
Um, and you've got, obviously, you've got computing, you've got ICT, and it's a big business, so you've got enterprise as well. So you've got all those critical areas that are involved um, in games, apart from maybe P. But I do, I do know a guy that worked for EA for a while, and he did take a, an American football down to the park, and he spent a lot of time just kicking it about to see how it rolled to try and simulate it in a game. So I guess even PE, perhaps. Now, this is far from not an extensive list at all. So this is just some of the tools I'm mentioning briefly that I've used um, or looked at. Um, nearly everything that you need for games development is free to education now, apart from Adobe. They're the last people holding out still charging education. Um, but there is alternatives. So you've got, for 2D animation is one that a lot of people don't do. There's one called Spine, which is really good, but it is expensive. And there's Spriter from a company called Brash Monkey, which I'll show you that later on. That one's free, um, although there is a professional edition of it, but even the professional edition isn't that expensive. Um, you've got Visual Studio Community Edition, which is all I've used for the past 10 years, really, and for an IDE, and that's free. Game Engines, I'm going to be talking about Unity. Unreal is the other big one. It's also totally free as well. The other one is Amazon Lumberyard. Has anybody heard of that one? Right, a couple of people. That is actually CryEngine. So if you're a gamer, you know CryEngine was... So there's some big games, Crisis, which use that engine. That one's free as well from Amazon, but not pr perhaps getting used as much in education. Um, for bitmap editors, Photoshop is the gold standard, but there is other ones you can use. Paint.net has been around for years, so is GIMP, and they both can do a lot of the things that Photoshop do. Um, and th there's a more recent one, Pixlr.com, which is an online one which you can do most of the things that you can do in Photoshop with. For vector graphics, Illustrator, again, is the gold standard, but there is a free one called Inkscape, which runs on Mac and PC. Um, quite a lot of these, by the way, are Mac and PC, Visual Studios, Mac and PC. I don't think Unreal is. I think Unreal is just Windows, but I might be wrong. Unity definitely is Mac and PC. Um, GIMP, I think, is. Inkscape is definitely. Blender is as well. Blender is a, th a free uh, 3D modeling and games development tool, which you can use on Mac and PC. However, some people don't realize Autodesk do give Maya and 3DS, which are the kind of standard for animation free to education. Um, so you can use them as well. So why Unity? Um, there's so many different games development tools out there and a lot, a lot of schools are obviously using Scratch and Game Maker and things like that. Um, so why use Unity? Um, well, it does 2D and 3D games really well. It's free to education at last. Okay, I say at last, about two years ago they went free. Before that, they were not free at all. Like I, when I was at college, we got a quote for one room and it was like four th equivalent to about four or $5,000 every year for that one room. So it wasn't free, but they have gone free now at last. Um, it's an industry standard tool and not just for games. Okay, so about 59% of VR developers use Unity. Um, it's not just used for games. Um, it's an in-demand skill, so you're actually teaching them something that they can then go out and make an app and publish it if you want, or actually it's quite an in-demand skill in industry as well, so you're teaching them something they can go out and actually do. The coding language is C-sharp. If you haven't used C-sharp, very close to Java. Java, C-sharp, you can almost go between the two because they're so close. Um, but it also, I think, prepares them for some of my students would go on to do courses where they had to do C++, and I think although it's not as difficult as C++, it does prepare them for that in a way because a lot of the syntax is the same. Um, and Unity is cross-platform, now not just for deployment, but also for development. So the reason it's called Unity is in theory, it's not quite true, but in theory you develop once and you can deploy out to all devices from Android to iOS to Windows to Xbox 360 to so on. Um, but the cool thing that I didn't suspect would work is that Development as well as cross-platform. So my school is actually a Mac school, all the kids of Macs. Um, and I was using Windows with them the first month or so on some PCs that we have for gaming. And you do need that for the VR. But we decided then to try it on their Macs. And much to my surprise, we copied their 2D game projects onto USB drives, put them onto the Mac, and they worked, which I was shocked at. So it actually went between Mac and PC and worked fine. Um, some of the challenges, the main challenge is probably especially for schools is the cost for doing the VR stuff, okay? The most expensive part is not the headsets, though it is this, <laughs> it's the gaming machine that you need to run it, okay? If you're trying to do VR, you really do need a 1060 graphics card, which means you're talking about, if, you, if you're looking at a laptop, about $1,000 per laptop at least, 
Okay, so that's, that is the biggest stumbling block, I would say. The headsets themselves are expensive, but these Windows Mixed Reality ones, which we'll talk about later, are actually reasonably cheap. Maybe you can get them for like $200. They're, they're actually a lot cheaper than Oculus and Vive. Um, and I'll mention a bit more about that in a minute. The main rival to Unity is Unreal Engine, and Unreal Engine is a good choice as well. It's used more for AAA games, whereas Unity is used more for the indie market. I, th I think Unity for coding works better with, uh, at school, but I know people are using Unreal as well. And Unreal is the engine that um, a small game called Fortnite is made in, so all the kids kind of know about Unreal Engine. And it's actually, I didn't realize to move to South Carolina, it's made uh, Epic are based in North Carolina and Charlotte, just north of where I am. So why do I start with 2D games? I usually start with 2D games just because it's slightly more accessible to the students. Um, but the way Unity works is pretty much everything you do in Unity is the same for 2D and 3D. That's not totally true, but it's mostly true. All the stuff you do transfers really well from 2D games to 3D games, but it prepares them without having to do that. And you don't need the high spec PC to do the 2D games. So the Macs that they were running were not as fast as the Windows PCs. So you can do 2D Unity without having the massive, expensive computer. Um, there is a good amount of resources. Unity has its own asset store, which has a lot of free resources and a lot of paid ones. So you can get a lot of stuff from that. But there's also, if you haven't used it, there's a good website, Open Game Art, which has been around for years. Open Game Art, everything's free on. Um, and you can download sprite sheets and graphics and sounds and even 3D models from there. But there's, there's lots of other sites as well. Unity supports animation sprite sheets, which I'll mention a bit later on. When I'm starting with 2D, I get my students to come up with a proposal. So we're trying to get them to do educational games, but in a kind of wider sense. And it's not just strictly education. It's like it could be instructing somebody how to drive a car. or So it's a kind of wider education. But I get them to come up with a proposal where they talk about the genre, who the target audience is, what the game mechanics are going to be, if there's a storyline and all those kind of things, and I get them to propose that to me before they get to start on their games. These are a couple of games that my, these were 10th grade um, upper school students did this year. So the one on the left was um, Chinese, number, Chinese words. So there was a word in English and you had to fly the dragon and get the correct symbol that matched. On the right was a driving one. So you had to, it was teaching about things like staying in the correct lane and you had to stop fully at the stop sign, which I've learned since moving to the States, you guys take really serious. So uh, uh, we have the same thing in the UK, but we don't really take it that serious. We tend to do a rolling. We don't really come to a full stop. However, I do, I also, I, the, I will say in, on our side that in the UK, we have a thing called a safe braking distance, which you guys just don't seem to have at all. <laughs> so, um, that, that game there was a girl made a game, a spelling bee game, kind of hangman style, which was quite cool. This one was really interesting on the left. The girl made that game, I found out later her mum is an alcoholic. So she made that game about her family. And in the game, there's a whole bunch of wine bottles hidden about the house and behind the couch and all over the place. And you have to get the wine and then you have to try and do your housework while drunk, basically. So it's a really interesting game. It kind of spoke to where she was at and it was a good... Um, it was a good expression for her creativity and where she was at and the struggle she was going through. Um, and I, I should have shown you, but she made that character herself. She drew that and it is actually animated and it walks and everything as well. That was a game about Spanish and you had to get the right, you had to catch the basic, catch the object that matched the Spanish word. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple running from Unity. So this was one that one of my guys did and it was a bit like i don't know if you remember inner space or incredible journey but that kind of idea so you're inside the blood cell so that's the unit environment and i'm running it and you had to guide the red blood cell and you had to find viruses and destroy them um hopefully we'll find a virus soon there's usually one down here there's one there so you've got to shoot the white blood cells and you've got to get them with these white blood cells and then destroy them so i quite liked the mechanic in that it was a really different idea and he had to draw out the whole body and put colliders around the whole thing. This is one that was teaching about um, the periodic table. Um, I set it to, the first one it's set to water, which I did deliberately so that I know how to do that one because it's H2O. So you've got to go up and you've got to, I'm not very good at this one, you've got to get the, the thing from the periodic table and drop it there. So I've got to H twice, I think, if I can get it. And then drop it in here and get the old, 
and then drop it in here. And if you get it right, you get to then use the item. So you got to use the water now to just to put out the fire. So he's done about four of them, and you, there's different. There's a different bit after each one where you've got to use the item that you that you create. Um, and this one was a game based on recycling, but it looks quite nice. He, he got most of this art from Open Game Art, so he didn't make most of the art, but he put it together really well, and it kind of looks like a kind of Mario style game. Um, and you've got to like collect all the trash, and if you get all the trash, you then get another kind of mini game in it, which is quite cool. So if I can get this last one here and land down here. Always oh, doesn't work. There you go. Um, and then you've got to like drag the items into the correct, correct bins. That one's going in the trash, and so on. And then you can view your results and tells you how good you are. So those are some examples of some of the, the games that they made. Um, this is Sprite. I'll just show this briefly. So these, those two were made by my college students, and they created the graphics for them all themselves in Illustrator. But then they put them together in Sprite. Um, this is what Spriter looks like. So if I run this, this is just making a flappy bird. So you can, you basically get, you have to get the part, the, the parts of the object as different parts and you drag them in and you just kind of assemble your character like that. Okay, and you can put things in front or behind by moving it here. And then you do keyframe animation. So basically that only has about maybe one, two, three, four, five keyframes. Wing up, wing in the middle, wing down and then back up again. Um, and with that, you can make a simple animation. So it should look like, let's see if I play that there. So you get, a, I notice I moved the head as well, so it looks like he's nodding. But you can export that to a sprite sheet, which you can then bring into a lot of different game engines. So that's a sprite sheet there. And you can bring that into like a Unity and use it in there as an animated character. But it also does what you would more traditionally do in 3D animation, it does rigging. So you can actually put, uh, you can put uh, bones basically inside and attach body parts to it. So you've got to go through and put all the bones in and then you attach them to different body parts. And when you do it right, what happens is you can then move the arms, do you see? Okay. Um, and then you can make it do what you want. So in this example, I, get to, I, I use keyframes by moving the, bo the bones and eventually I get a kind of, I did, this one didn't turn out perfect, but I got a kind of running animation there, you see. And again, that can be exported to a sprite sheet or a GIF, which you can use in your games. Um, so Unity 3D, when I'm doing that with students, I say the main difference is going to be that we're going to use the Z axis. Okay, so we've got X and Y, but now we're introducing Z. Um, I'm developing when I do the VR for Steam VR. Okay, and there's a reason for that. I'm not developing for native Windows Mixed Reality. And I'll cover up this while I say this. These are not doing that well, <laughs> so I wouldn't develop for them. Steam VR is better because Steam VR was originally HTC Vive, which is still probably my favorite VR headset. Um, the problem with HTC Vive in a classroom situation is when I used HTC Vive um, and I did, took it to conferences, it took me around about 20 to 30 minutes to set that thing up. Okay, you have two motion sensors, which I was using in a photography stand. You're meant to actually screw them into the wall. It takes a long time to set up. It's not realistic in a classroom situation if you're putting them up and down each day to have, if you've got 15 students and you're trying to put up 15 HTC Vives, it just wouldn't work. They also use room scale, which means you can walk about. So you need floor space. So each student needs about, I was gonna say meters there, but say about nine square feet, okay, um, of floor space. Um, and they're expensive, um, but they are probably the best. And then Oculus Rift is a similar thing, very close. Steam VR now supports both Oculus and HTC Vive and Windows Mixed Reality. Now the advantage of this is those that were here at the start saw that I set this thing up in about five minutes. The disadvantage is it'll mess up, <laughs> okay? But um, for the, the main thing that messes up with this is instead of having fixed motion sensors, the motion sensors are on the headsets and it's called inside out tracking. But what that tends to mean in reality is quite a lot of time when I bend down to pick something up, the floor moves away from me, right? It happens quite often that. However, it takes five minutes to set up. A lot of the time it works fine and it's much more realistic in a classroom situation and it's fine for developing and testing it. We have one HTC Vive, so like if they want to do it on that at the end, they can just take it and put it onto that. 
That one's uh, Lenovo, but there, there's about five or six different. There's not. We have the Acer, we have the HP, we've got the Lenovo. There's not a lot of difference between them, right? The, basically, Windows, uh, Microsoft brought out a spec for a VR headset or mixed reality headset, even though they're not really mixed right now. They are just virtual. Um, and they basically got all the kind of people that make PCs. Even Samsung, for instance, has one of these out. They're relatively cheap, especially because they're not doing great. You can get them for about $200 each now, which is a lot better than the HTC Vive and, and things, OK? And they, they are supported in Steam VR now. For, for, for using uh, Unity, you've got a bunch of three assets as well for that as well. But there's also sites like Sketchfab, Remix 3D, which is a cool one from Microsoft, which has a lot of free artwork as well that you can use. This is something I discovered this year, which is cool. So if you don't have time to do Blender or 3DS properly, Autodesk has a free tool for making avatars. OK, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, it's just called Character Generator. And the website is just charactergenerator.autodesk.com. Um, and there's another app that I found called Bellis 3D on the iPhone that does that scary scan. So that's free on the iPhone X. You need to have X and above because it needs a depth camera. And it will do a, f a full 3D scan of your head. Um, the catch is it's free, but if you want to export and use it, you need to pay a monthly subscription. We just paid $10 one month, and we just scanned as many people as we could, and then we stopped paying. <laughs> so that's how we got around that. Um, and that is one of my students. That's the two things combined. So we that's one of my students, and we scanned them, and we stuck. And I, I did. I used Maya for that, and I cut the head off the original model and stuck that head on. Right. And then this is another site that's really good, Adobe Mixamo, which I'm going to show you. Right. So these are the websites here. So that's the one where you can customize it. So it is that tool is really easy. Um, you can just basically. Oh, I've lost internet. Uh, I will skip. I'll see if this one will still work. So, uh, what's the internet I connected? Does anyone know? Uh, I'll come back. Th that site is, you can kind of see the animations there. If I, what should happen is if I click on them, he will actually do that animation. Okay, so it's really cool because you can, in the character generator site, you can create the character, you can choose hair, you can choose the body, you can do all that stuff. You can make a character. It's kind of free. If you do too many exports, it starts to ask you to charge you. So you can do so many free. Um, and then you can export it and import it into this. And it's very easy to rig it in there. You just like select the ankles and the knees and the groin and things like that. And then it just animates it for you. And it fully rigs it, which is actually really hard to do in 3DS and Maya. Um, and then you can literally make it do any of those animations in there, okay, including walking and running and jumping and all the kind of things you'd like to do in a game. Um, I'll show you actually, I've got a demo that has that in it. So, let me see. So yeah, let me just show you a, a game that has that in it. So this was a game one of my girls created. Let's see if it will run. So she loves cats and she made a, a simulation about taking care of her cat. But she created a bunch of people that kind of walk about in it. And these were created in that program that I was talking about. So you see there, that's, that's a character there that she's created. You see her? And she's walking about and stuff. OK. And I don't know why my, head's, my handset has inverted itself. There we go. That's better. Right, OK. So um, and she's got all these people walking about. And you'll see I'm kind of sliding about. Now, what I'm doing now can make a lot of people dizzy. But I'm kind of used to it. But a lot of people get dizzy. And in this room, you've got this cat. And I think I'm going to try and do this without hitting anything. So this is where it messes up. I should be able to get that ball. <laughs> so this is where I'm talking about when you bend down, it sometimes loses the tracking. I should be able to grab that ball and throw it, and the cat will follow it about. Um, I'm going to show you one other one. So this was a game. This is a very simple idea, but I think it's sometimes the simple ideas are the best. So this is just a window cleaning simulation. And all I have to do in here is pick up that, pick up the brush, stick it in the water, and then I can clean it. And I have to keep putting it back in there, do you see? OK. And so on. And it actually gives you, if you don't like heights, it actually isn't good, because you do get that sense of height on it. And then I've lost my thing. And one other one I'm going to show you is this one, which was 
the idea this is going to be a VR baggage handler at the airport. So you've got to go over here and touch that to begin. And he's basically created, he's got nice, some nice touches to this. I like the fact that he used a video which he put on the wall, although I did tell him I thought it was too fast. But the video is playing, it looks like a window looking out to the airport and then the luggage comes randomly and you've got to pick it up and sort it and throw it into the right bucket here and so on. And if you do it correct, you get points. And I missed that one. <laughs> and I think if I find, and that headset has got score there, do you see? Yeah, we've got two, right, I'm trying to do the green one. And you notice that I can like pass these between my hands and you know, it's quite good that way. And I say, a lot of the artwork he did that he created himself, because um, you can see the kind of simplistic models and he was able to do that himself, which was quite good. No, no, we were we did about we only did about a week of it, but we did about a week and a half of Maya, just very basic modelling in it, and just to so they could have so some of them that were good at that could could do that. Um, these are some of the my senior students did a whole bunch of projects, and they had been doing three years of CS and they'd already done a lot of C sharp, so they were a bit more advanced. So this guy made one. Let's see if I can get sound on this. This guy did one where um, he was basically a VR conductor. We get a wee bit of sound. Experience practi practicing so conducting an orchestra. And then this girl did. This girl created a VR so solar system, and she actually worked with the physics teacher in the school to get the calculations for making the planets move round. And as she says, you can Matt Damon your way around the universe um, and learn about the universe, and that was quite good. And we're trying to get this guy did one about nutrition, and it was about training like for you know working out seriously which is why there's so many high calorie foods i think um and this girl created one you can see it up there rocking it where you had to train to be a surgeon on a stitcher pad i think it's called for those that know about medicine might know what that is um, and this was a hurricane simulator so you had to like board up your house and he actually found some assets in the asset store that did simulate wind and rain and all that so it's quite it looked quite good. This was a, basically a farming simulator where you had to drive a tractor. And that was a kind of drawing simulation. This one was one I thought was funny, but actually was quite good. It was a VR librarian. So whether we need a virtual reality simulation to train librarians, I don't know. But And he did make the books himself. He worked a long time trying to make the books open, which he kind of got and kind of didn't. And you had to put them in the right sections. And that one was a rock climbing one there, where you had to climb up a rock face. You can see him there doing it. It's really just using the hands, but it worked quite well. This one was a driving one, where you actually turned the steering wheel using the handsets, and you could drive. This one was a firefighting one, so you had to use the handsets as hoses. And that one there, <clears throat> she, could, she actually was really not good at the coding, but that was one of the things I liked about Unity. There is a whole design side and she was able to create a whole doctor's office. And so she ended up really good at that side of it and you can actually do an x-ray. Um, and the interesting thing was when she goes around the, when she goes around the corner, that x-ray there that she's used, she push a button and that x-ray appears. That was actually her own x-ray of when she broke her own leg and she took the, she scanned it and used it in it. Um, that was a basketball, we had a basketball simulation as well, you had to shoot hoops. That was actually quite hard to get right, because you don't have the weight of the ball, so it's quite difficult that. And that was an archery one, so, and that one was, that one was pushing the education side a bit, was a Halloween simulation. But we, we had an event with the lower school, so we said he could do it, because we were going to use it with the lower school. Um, so that was some of them. Now, um, this was a cool project I want to mention for the last few minutes. Um, the senior guys worked for about three, four months doing those individual ones and learning how to do Unity. Um, and then via the contacts I have in Microsoft, we tied up with the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, um, which was quite cool. 
Thankfully, it wasn't until the last two weeks of the project that I realised that the Karolinska Institute in Sweden is the hospital that signs a Nobel Prize for medicine. I'm glad I didn't know that, because <laughs> we didn't realise they were such a big deal. But the idea was that Microsoft wanted to try using virtual reality to treat kids that were going through cancer treatment. So they have a kids' hospital there. And one of the things that they said freaked the kids out the most was actually when they were getting their, in I say injections, but you guys say shots, don't you? When they were getting their jags, their shots. That was one of the things that freaked them out the most because, and it wasn't for the pain, because they were numbing them anyway, it was just seeing the needle coming. So one of the ideas they wanted to experiment with was having virtual reality where they would put the headset on and the doctor would hit a button and then a fairy would come up and rub something on them and at that point they would give them the shot. <laughs> so it was to kind of distract them and calm them down. But also the other side that they wanted us to look at was when the kids are sitting getting their chemotherapy, they spent hours just sitting there. So they were going to use it as distraction and, and for reward as well when they go through things. We split into teams for that and we split our seniors into teams of four, three and four. We had six teams and they created six different projects. We had a, a kind of dinosaur Jurassic Park style one. We had two underwater adventures. We had a virtual eye spy in space and we had a kind of kids room with robots. That was quite cool. I don't think you'll hear this, but that was a report that the local news did on it. I don't think the sound is the sound. Students here in Charleston are helping yeah. thousands well, maybe of children. Uh, 4,561 I'll skip on to the actual bit. So that's our classroom there. You can see our headsets. So we have them all numbered. Um, but they really got quite engaged with the project because they had a real client. Um, that was... That was the kind of kids playroom, so they did the, the animation stuff quite well and in that one there was a robot that came up and, and plugged into you and charged you up and that was when, the, when you would get the shot. And we tried it out with some of the kids in the school as well. And that was the underwater tour. And that was me Skyping in because <laughs> I wasn't there that week. Um, so we did, that was a cool project. We got to Skype in with Microsoft and with the doctors in the hospital, which is quite cool. Um, the guy on the left is the guy that I know in Microsoft, but those two guys were from the Hollands team. That's Mike and Pete from the Hollands team. And they talked to them about their ideas and helped them. Um, these are some of the proposals they came up with. So this was the team that wanted to do the dinosaur thing. So they were wanting to create a dinosaur park to uh, distract them. This team wanted to do an underwater adventure. So they came up with these ideas about how they would do it and different inspirations for it. They, they were going to have puzzles in it, which is why they mentioned Tetris. Um, and this last team, they were going to do the kind of kids' playroom. So they drew out this art. And it actually ended up looking quite like that. And they made, they actually did model that character themselves in Maya. Um, I think the advantages of doing these kind of group projects, especially in games development, is well, one, it's, that's the way it's, it's done in industry. It is teams, it's not individuals. It's very rare that an individual will create a game, although it does occasionally happen. But it teaches a bunch of soft skills. So you've got things like teamwork, problem solving, communication, leadership, time management. Um, we got them to assign each other roles. So they decided that. I gave them some ideas, but we had you know, lead artist, lead designer, lead coder, that kind of thing. Um, and they had real deadlines to meet and they had a real client to get things to us, so that was really cool. Um, it allowed them to play to their strengths, so there was like the girl that did the doctor's office, she concentrated on the artwork for her game, um, whereas some of the other kids that were good at coding concentrated on that. We even added in, which is a bit controversial, we had a peer review, but it did make them accountable to each other, so 10% of the grade that they got at the end of the year was given to each other by their teammates, and they had to sit together and they had to decide that. Um, and mostly that went fine, and we didn't really have a big issue with it. Um, realistic, it's a realistic experience and environment for them, and it's good for putting on the college application. Okay, so um, here's the... So this was, this was the underwater adventure one where you had to collect oh, keys. Key. So you had to collect the keys, and you had to find a portal to open up. So you had to grab the key, and then you had to go over to these portals over here, which I'll skip to. And transport, and then they did quite a lot of work in that one. That one ended up really quite cool. And this was the other underwater one, which this one was just sit back and you. They made a submarine, which they made themselves. They didn't make the whales; they got them from the asset store. But they created a tour, and that's one of my students doing a voiceover. 
And basically you just sit back, so the kid can sit back, they can sit in the chair, they can stand, and another pirate in it as well. This ship was called the Queen Anne's Revenge. So it was funny though because some of the stuff in the in the voiceover is true and some of it is just stuff he made up. <laughs> so like stuff about the pirate was a lot of rubbish. But um but he had some true facts about the about the whales and the fish and stuff. So what I'm gonna do now is just quickly show you a demonstration of Unity and 3D how to create something. So I'm gonna delete that. So this is one a, a basic world I've created. Right, so in this, and you can try this at the end if you want. So this is one, I've got a table, I've got bananas and donuts, and I can throw them at that target. I knew I was gonna miss when I did this. <laughs> I'm trying to hit that target, there we go. Okay, that's, for those that know Doug Bergman, I know a few people here do, that's him saying sweet. So we can throw that at that, and if I hit it, it'll, it'll say sweet. And you can see, you can pass it between the handsets, and do that. You can also, I've said it so that it can shoot things out the handset as well, so I can shoot multiple bananas and donuts, and that makes it easier for me to hit the target there. And you see I've got score and health there on the handsets. But to show you how to add something in quickly, so I'm going to add in this scary head scan of me because it's funny. <laughs> so there's that head that I scanned in in Bellis. Now I've already, I've cheated a bit because I've already added to this a rigid body. So in Unity you've got rigid bodies which give physics. So when you add a rigid body you've got things you can set like drag and mass and gravity. Um, and then I've added a collider on it already as well. You can see if I turn the collider off, the collider goes around the head to make it collide with things. So those are the two kind of things that you need to add to make it work with physics. So I'm going to, dra I've dragged that in and if I run it again, what we should see now is that scary model of my head. Can you see that there? Yeah. Now the Bellis thing, it does it, it does a really good scan, you see, but it doesn't do the back of the head. <laughs> so, so that's a bit strange. There we go. Okay, so you can easily add things in to pick them up. Um, but the other thing is the code is reasonably straightforward as well. So this is some of the code. This is the code that's on that target. So I've got two audio sources, and you make them public, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, I could make a score one on it, but I've done the score on the handset, so I'm not used that, but I could make the score public. I'll do that just to show what happens. Um, and then you've got two events. We've got on trigger and on collision. Now the difference is, in Unity, when you make a collider, so like if I added in, say, just a basic object, like a cube, okay, and I can move that. If I added in a cube, it comes with a box collider, and the box collider is simply a, a, a collider that goes around it, you see, and you can adjust it, okay? Um, now, when you collide with that, it fires on collision event, but if you set it to is trigger, it then becomes a trigger, which means you can throw things through it, you can put your hand through it, and so on. Um, and you would maybe use that for things like, for instance, say you're doing a game with helicopter landing on a, a pad, you would make it a trigger so that it lands on it and it can go into it, but it triggers an event. So in here I've got two different ones. I've got on trigger and on collision. And I've basically set the center of the target to be a trigger and the outside to be a collision. So when anything hits that at all, it passes to me in the other property, the name of it. So you can either use tag or name. And the difference in Unity between tag and name is that everything has to have a unique name. So if this was donut, that's donut one, donut two, donut three. However, I've tagged them all as donut, okay? Which means in the code you can say if the thing is tagged as donut, then do this. Otherwise, you'd have to write if name equals donut one or donut two or donut, and it would just get silly. So the tags are really useful. So I can say that if anything, what I've said there is if anything other than the handsets hits the, con hits the target, play a sound, destroy that object so you notice it disappeared when it hit it, and give score onto the, the handset, okay? Now this bit of code here is, I'm gonna put this in, what that does is, when it hits the object and it's not a, it's not a trigger, um, I'm gonna get the rigid body. The rigid body is the physics part, and if it is the head, which I've tagged myself as the head, I'm gonna do two things. Um, we, I, I'm putting these in because we discovered these recently and it's quite good. You can set it to static and you can freeze it. And what that basically does, if I save that, 
and I'm going to add that script to the wall. What it should do is, let's try and see. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to add component, go down to scripts and add on that script if it comes up. Let's try again, add component, scripts and collide. Okay, and I'm not going to bother with sound. So I'm going to play that now and what we'll see if this works. So what should happen is if I grab the head and throw it off the wall, it sticks. <laughs> so you can do things like that. Okay, you can make it play a sound. You can make, you don't need to make it stick. There's various things you can do. So the coding in C Sharp is, it's not easy, but it's not you know, super hard either. It's something they can get their head around. The idea of public and private is obviously something we normally discourage in programming. But what happens when you set things to public in Unity, it means that if I click on that wall, that's that property called score that was an integer that I set now appears in here. So I can now go in and I can set that to 50. So some of the guys um, did a project where they had to make um, three targets and throw things at them. And what they did was they had a pub, the same script on each three of them, and they had a public score, and the score would be set differently for each one. Instead of having to go into the code for each of the three objects and set that score, they were able just to do it inside Unity by having the property public. So they could go in and they could say, that wall is worth 50. I could click on this wall. I could add the same script to it. And I could set that wall to be worth 100. Right, and then what I could say in the game is add that score property to it, right, instead of instead of just one. So if I run that now, what should happen is if I get um, if I throw off one wall, it should get fifty. So let's make two heads. You can duplicate me. I'm going to right click and duplicate and duplicate and move them. Right, so I've got a bunch of heads here now. Okay. So if I drag that one and throw it off that one, it did not work. <laughs> so that was a bad demonstration. <laughs> yeah, so I think what I did wrong was, let's move that up to there. Let's do that first. Oh, I'm doing it in the wrong one. That's what it is. It's this one, isn't it? Right, so let's drag that line of code and put it down here. Yeah, I was doing it in the wrong event. So let's run that again and see if that works. So you notice that I'm using Visual Studio in there to edit the code. And all I need to do is save the script and it updates inside Unity. Okay, so this time if I throw it off the wall, I get 50 points. And I don't know where the other head... Oh, I managed to get it. I'm going to go and throw it off that wall. So... And they got 100. So it's quite, that's the usefulness of that. It means they can have things like, if they're creating a game with a car or whatever, they could have properties like s speed or <coughs> breaking power, whatever it wants to be, and they can just manually play about with them inside Unity without having to keep going back to the code. So that's why um, you have public variables, even though it's kind of frowned on, isn't it, a lot of the time? But it's used quite a lot in Unity that way. Um, why video studio? Modern Develop's gone now, oh. so Unity discontinued it, so about a year and a half ago. <laughs> so yeah, there, there was a free, Unity had their own IDE called Modern Develop. Um, I, I, th I think it's just something they decided to go with. A lot of people were using Visual Studio, so they're now just Visual Studio. Even on Mac, it's Visual Studio now as well. Um, anyway, I'm going to go back, to, I'm going to put that contact back up if you want to get in touch. Um, so we've got about three minutes left. Have you got any? I know we're not meant to take questions, I think, in these sessions, but have you got any questions? Yeah. I have yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you can talk. Yeah. Ask. Well, help me with one or two, and then we can. Well, we have kind of a similar, interesting background because I was also, I was faculty at UCF for 14 years, and now for some reason I'm a high school teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you I, can leave. <laughs> I, I teach uh, game development, also 
So my question is, how long do you, are, is this a semester-long class, a year-long class? What's the prerequisite? Well, for the seniors, it was a, it was a year-long thing, but we did the first semester, we did the game development um, just individually. And then the second semester, which we hadn't planned, we spent pretty much the whole of the second semester on this project. We were meant to be doing Swift, which I didn't have to do, so I was glad. <laughs> but um, yeah, and for the 10th the grade, we did it with them as well. We only had a semester, so. It was about average of five hours a week over maybe 16, 17 weeks. So, yeah, it was a bit tight, but uh, yeah. Any other questions? We good? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm sure if you, if you want a copy of the presentation with the links to the website, just send me a tweet. In fact, I'll put, I should have put my email up. I'll add that up there so you can email me directly. It's just the, it's just the, Renton at portergo.edu. So if you want to email me, um, I have a bunch of materials that I've shared with some teachers when I was at CAS recently. So if you want any of those, you can email me. And um, I can share the presentation with you as well, if you like. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Good to meet you. How's it going? I was going to go to your session, but I thought I'd practice this first. Yeah, <laughs>